So welcome back everybody and uh, welcome to uh, a partly a new topic which we are going to uh, dive into this week and also next week and this deals with uh, more advanced deep learning methods and the kind of methods we are going to look at now are called convolutional neural network which is a kind of state of the art in uh, imaging nowadays and we're also going to look at the recurrent neural networks which have been widely popular in the analysis of what's called time series, for instance. It's also very popular in uh, natural language processing and many, many other applications. So, uh, but before we do that, uh, I wanted to give you a kind of reminder of what we discussed yesterday about uh, applications of neural networks to the solution of differential equations. So, as I mentioned, this is a very, very hot topic. And in many disciplines in science, uh, since we often end up dealing with multidimensional differential equations, where the problem is a very large dimensionality. So if you're looking at, for instance, the solution of Navier-Stokes equations for weather forecasting, then turbulence is a topic which uh, plays a very important role. And if you uh, live from fishing in the Arctic, uh, you are very varied to the way the weather develops and turbulence is one of the can be one of the big problems if you are out on a fishing boat so uh, these are topics which uh, many of you may actually encounter when you dive into your master thesis topics so we are going to look first a little bit at more at solutions of differential equations and this is going to form uh, one of the paths for the final projects so for those of you who are interested in that topic, uh, this is something you could actually uh, try to digress into if you want to. And uh, just as a quick reminder, if you look at the slides here, uh, there are some videos on deep learning. Uh, there's also some uh, material on uh, convolutional neural networks. And we do have a, a course at the University of Oslo, which is called IN5400. And uh, this course is actually machine learning applied to imaging. And that's actually a big, big activity. And in order to not have too much credit overlaps with that course, uh, we are going to look at convolutional neural networks in a slightly more superficial way. So we will not have that as our main emphasis. Actually, we are just going to spend some few lectures on convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. This is the main topic actually of IN5400, and which is a course which runs in the spring semester, and I normally recommend it uh, quite a lot. The, um, there's also some additional material, which I should have down here. No, not here, but it should be. Yeah, uh, there are some references on uh, back propagation, which you might find interesting. And as I mentioned yesterday, and also last week, uh, backpropagation is intimately linked with automatic differentiation. So if you look into some of these descriptions of the automatic differentiation procedure, this is, has two modes. One, where you move forward in a graph where you have a different dependencies of various variables and you use a chain rule. Or you can move backward where you start with the output and then retrace yourself to the input, which will be the x value. And that's called the reverse mode. And reverse mode in back in uh, automatic differentiation is actually the same as back propagation in deep learning methods. So if you're interested in looking at more the mathematics of these methods, so actually automatic differentiation is perhaps one of these under communicated algorithms, which uh, plays a very, very important role in uh, scientific applications and in particular in machine learning, where we often have uh, complex functions which we want to optimize and where we need to calculate the gradient quickly. So I invite you to take a look at these papers if you're interested. And as I said also, for the final project, the, uh, there is always the possibility to define your own path. And like last year, we had a group who actually researched the uh, stochastic gradient methods, or just gradient methods applied to different data sets and looked at different ways of implementing them. 
So that could be a theme for the last project. But you could have another theme which deals with the implementation of automatic differentiation and backpropagation, if you're interested in more the mathematics of the methods. So this is very much up to you. We have a lot of flexibility as long as you cover, obviously, the topics which we have covered here, right? I mean, it's not that you, no, I don't want to write about this course, but I would like to write about another course, which I like much more. So this would obviously defy the intention, right? And then, if you're interested, I've added some more references. Uh, there's actually a uh, textbook which essentially covers many of the things we have done now on the application of uh, neural network methods for differential equations. If you wish to look into that and you find this an interesting topic, feel free to look at it. We have uh, a, a very nice master thesis by Marius Holm, who actually used deep learning methods for solutions of Navier-Stokes equations. You could take a look into that thesis if you're interested in topics like that. So that's just one starting point. Now, to uh, remind you of the solution of differential equations uh, and then uh, go back to the implementations of them, I just wanted to remind you quickly a little bit about the mathematics and how we actually do solve differential equations using neural networks. So let me just quickly bring that back by using the, the whiteboard. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, if there's something is unclear. <clears throat> so if we look at the solution of differential equations, uh, last uh, lecture, I mean yesterday, we went through uh, a very simple equation of a first order differential equation in just one dimension and where we had only initial conditions. Now, in general, you are not limited to solve equations with initial conditions only. You can actually add the boundary conditions. So if you're dealing with partial differential equations, you will typically also have boundary uh, conditions in addition to the initial conditions. So if we now look at an example case, and let's just bring this up, differential equations, and with differential equations, I'm not going to limit myself to uh, what we normally call ordinary differential equations, which are typically equations where you only have initial conditions and no boundary condition. But I'm also uh, extending that to the field of partial differential equations. So if you look at differential equations, we have a, a one example which you may have encountered is an equation like the diffusion equation. So we have a du dt. So this is a famous equation in science, but not only in science, is actually if you add some stochastic elements, this uh, brings us, uh, if you apply this in, sci in, in uh, finance, this brings us to an equation which is called the black skulls equation. And that was used to um, simulate uh, the evolution of uh, I think obligations in the in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, stock market, and it's actually a diffusion equation with a uh, stochastic term, so you have an additional term, and Black and Scholes actually got the Nobel Prize in economy for having invented the Black Scholes equation, which is nothing that the diff than a diffusion equation with a stochastic term. That's pretty neat. So we would have something like this. This is an equation which many of you may have seen. And you may have some initial conditions. And these initial conditions could be of the type of u, which is now a function of x, y, and t, uh, is now given by some u, or rather t0. So we could now have an x, a y, and we could have t0 equal to 0, just to give you an example. So this could be t0 equal to 0. And this now is given by some function which depends only on x and y. So that could be an example, a very, very general example of a um, initial condition. And then you could have boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions could be of the type that u of some x of 0, y of t 
is given by some function, and let's call this function f of y and t. We could have another one where we have the endpoint xn of y of t is given by a new function h y of t, etc. We would have similar conditions for y, for the initial value for y, and the final value for y. So these are examples of conditions which we would put on the differential equations. Now, what we did yesterday in a more general form is actually to rewrite this equation. So we, we rewrote yesterday a general differential equation. This du of dt equal to d, and then I'm just putting dots because it's the same equation. We would rewrite this in terms of a, a function f, where we now have the x as a vector, y, we have t, and then we have the, the function, which is now u of x, y of t. And then we have the function, which has a derivative of du dt. There is a derivative or a gradient with respect to x. There is a gradient with respect to y. And then in this particular case, we would have the second derivative with respect to the function to respect to x. And then we have the second derivative with respect to the variable y. And this function is something which we would put equal to zero. And that means that this function in this specific case is now given by du dt minus, and then we have d, and then we have this d second derivative of dx plus d second derivative with respect to y. So uh, what we defined next was that we tried now to uh, uh, come up with an ansatz for this uh, uh, function u, which we want to evaluate. And this ansatz is normally given in terms of a neural network with some given parameters. And then this neural network should also be something which uh, obeys the boundary conditions and the initial conditions. So typically, what we would assume then is an ansatz where this function u of x, y, and t is now given by some initial function, which we can uh, uh, define as a, uh, as a function which could perhaps respect some of the initial conditions or the boundary conditions. So let's just call this for a function g0 of x, y, of t. And then we will have something which runs like a new function, which we just call g. And this is a function which depends on x, y, and t in the general case here. And then a neural network, which takes as input x, y, and t, and is defined in terms of the parameters. So these are the parameters which we want to adjust. Then the cost function is actually us minimizing the difference between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And you can minimize that using the absolute value, or you can take the squared difference between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And then you would optimize your neural network till this difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is driven to what you have defined to be zero, or an acceptable a small error. So this is something you will have to decide upon. So the cost function, a typical cost function in this case, cost or loss function, or error function, if you want to use that. <coughs> a typical cost or loss function in this specific case could be now a C, which now depends on these variables x, y, and t, and then the parameters theta, and then this would typically be given by the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which is this function f, which now depends on x, y, and t, and theta, and we would typically square this function here. So this would be the norm two squared, and that looks very much like what we have been doing previously in terms of the standard cost function for the mean squared error, except that now 
we have to evaluate both the left-hand side and the right-hand side based on the ansatz we have made. So when we are calculating the derivative now, we need actually the derivative of the neural network. And we need the second derivative with respect to the neural network for this type of equations. Now, one of the examples which we looked at yesterday was actually a simple example where we had some kind of exponential decay. And when we take an exponential decay, this situation is much simpler because we have only one variable. And what you could do then is actually to bake in into this function which you see here. You could actually try in this function to bake in some of the uh, initial conditions. So let's go back to some of the examples. So in, in essence, this is the philosophy of the way you solve differential equations. And this uh, function which we have here, this function g here, and this other function, these are functions which you would tune also to respect the initial conditions. In many cases, you will see people just dropping this term and multiply this term here with some function dependence which reflects the initial conditions or boundary conditions. So if you know what the initial conditions are, you could actually multiply this with a factor so that when x is 0, you get 0, for instance. When x is 1, which could be another initial condition or boundary condition, then you could also require that the function should be 0. Yeah? The question relates to the, the derivative stability. So yeah. you get the forward order or backward order or yeah. this is the have stability in the group yeah. where we find the step size has a yeah. of stability. How is that related? Yeah. So for those of you online, there's a question about the stability of these equations. And when you use a normal solver with a finite difference scheme, you have often an estimate of the error you make, the truncation error. And that means that you can actually have a reliable estimate of the error of what you have left out. So if you do, for instance, a Cripe-Nicholson application, you know exactly what the error should look like. In these methods here, the only guarantee we have is the universal approximation theorem. So we cannot set up an estimate of what the error is going to look like. So this is actually you who has to play around with the depth of the network. And this goes back to the architecture which we discussed yesterday and last week. So you're setting up a neural network with a given number of nodes and a given number of hidden layers, given types of activation functions, and your results will depend upon that. And the only thing we can invoke is the universal approximation theorem, which says that we can approximate this function to a given error. But that's the only thing we can say. So unfortunately, another thing uh, which you should think of, and which is, uh, so neural networks give you an incredible flexibility in solving scientific problems. The problem, however, is that what you're doing now is to find the optimal parameters, theta, and this is a minimization problem for all the theta which we have. And I'm just writing R here because this could be a multidimensional function of this cost function which we have here. So when you optimize the problem, what you end up with is just a set of parameters which can be difficult to link to a specific interpretation. So in project number one, when you did the polynomial fit, then may actually be quantities which have a polynomial behavior. And then when you make the fit, you could say that, okay, my fit is pretty close to what we expect from this physical system. On the other hand, when you run a neural network calculation, you just have zillions of parameters. And you will just find parameters which do not tell you immediately what kind of interpretations you can make based on that. So that's a drawback. Now, there is a remedy to that. And the remedy to that is that what you could do now, suppose you have a simpler model, you could actually calculate the overlap between what the network gives you and the simpler model. So suppose now that the network is as close as you can get to the ideal solution of the problem. 
So you imagine then that the network is the best possible way you can represent it. And it's such a complicated animal that all these parameters data are very difficult to interpret, but you can then project it down to a smaller model. And then you can start making the interpretation. What is the network giving me? What is the difference between the simpler model and the complex network? So life, I believe life is complicated. I mean, my life has been always complicated. And uh, uh, I don't believe in simpler solutions. I never done it. And I think life is complicated. Sometimes we find some simple interpretations, but then clearly, a neural network to me reflects much more the complexity of life. So that's my, that's a kind of philosophical take which I like to have. And in many cases, you don't know what the solution looks like. But obviously, we always want, when we interpret the results, we want to extract something simple. So me as a physicist, for instance, I always want to interpret the results in terms of the physical laws. So I have laws which are translated into equations of motion, like Newton's equation. And then clearly I want to analyze the result in terms of the forces which act on the system. And sometimes that can be complicated when you do a neural network calculation. And that's where you have to bring in your discipline-specific knowledge. Let's uh, switch back a little bit to the uh, uh, neural uh, the calculations. So there is a question in the chat here about the ansatz. So the, uh, uh, the ansatz here means that we have a uh, assumed uh, form for the solution. And uh, the assumed form for the solution here is that that can be expressed by a neural network. So that's what I mean by an ansatz in, in these calculations here. Okay. So let's go back to the, uh, to the Jupyter Notebook and take a short look at that and run some calculations here. So we should have the Jupyter Notebook here. So let me just bring up the calculations of, neuro, of uh, differential equations. So the, uh, a very simple case which we looked at yesterday was that of exponential decay. And this is a pretty uh, simple equation, which I mean, actually doing the numerical calculation is an overkill. Most of you would agree with that because you can actually find a nice analytical solution. And in this case, uh, what we had is a case with a value for this gamma parameter equal to two and a G zero, which is equal to 10. So when we are setting up the network now, we will have a kind of a trial solution or ansatz for the solution which then is a function of the neural network where p are the parameters so if we scroll down a little bit what we have done now is actually to have some g0 which is this initial value and then we have multiplied the network with x now this function x you may ask where does it come from uh, you could say that i know that my solution is an exponential so x would then enter there but what that X is also doing is that it ensures that you respect the initial condition. So because what I require is that when G, or when, when this X is equal to zero, which we have here, then it should equal to, to G zero. So that means if I put X equal zero here, then that obviously takes away this term from the neural network. So that means that my solution by this multiplicative factor, that will always obey the initial condition. So that's a simple way by which we can bake in the initial conditions. So it's not only that uh, we know that the solution may depend on X. If you think of E to the minus X, which is the solution, then, and you do a Taylor expansion, you know that X should be there. But this is also baked in, in order to respect the initial conditions. Because if I didn't do that, I may not get the initial condition, right? So you see now the kind of pattern, if we also have boundary conditions, you would have to think of a way to respect the boundary conditions. So if, if suppose now you have a boundary condition on X, not an initial condition, but a boundary condition, where when X is equal to zero, 
you should get zero. And when x is equal to one, you should get zero. So what kind of function could you think of then if you uh, want to implement such a boundary condition? So suppose now you want to have, you have a boundary condition where the solution is zero when x is zero, and it's zero when x is one. What kind of functional dependence could you think of? Because this x, which you see here, that is something I bake in so that when x is zero, the neural network is zero, and then I have g zero, right? Which I plug in, so g zero is put to 10. Yeah? Yes. So one thing you could do now, if you look at that specific case, and we go back, we switch back to, sorry. <laughs> If we switch back to the whiteboard, you and we now have a, a boundary condition. So just as an example, let me just bring that up. So suppose now you have an example here. So we have a, an equation here where g of zero is equal to zero. And then we have a g of one, which is equal to zero. And we could think of x being a function which lives between zero and one. And that's where we want to find the solution. So this will be a, a problem which we, when we're looking at differential equations, we would call this a two point boundary value problem. And if you look back in your mathematics text, you may have seen this defined as a Dirichlet boundary condition. If that, I don't hope that rings a bell. So in that specific case, what we could do now is simply to have an ansatz or a trial function, which depends on X. And we would have, so if we call this a G, we could have something which is given by a G uh, zero, let's just call it that without specifying it. But then we could have X times one minus X. And this is multiplied with our neural network with all the parameters theta, just as an example. So you see that in this case, if this function which you have here, this is a function which is going to obey this condition and that condition. Let's assume that just for simplicity. And now you see that the neural network will obviously be different from the boundary conditions, but then multiplying it with a term like that ensures that you obey the boundary conditions. So these are just things you need to think a little bit about when you're implementing neural networks because the neural network may not know anything or may not respect the boundary conditions but your equation has to respect them and this is a simple way by which you can then plug in these boundary conditions okay so let's go back and uh, look at uh, some calculations here of these simple cases so uh, if you look at the problem here yeah So, 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 so what I said now is that this G zero includes both boundary conditions. So I just wrote it in a generic way. So you could, you could actually think of with this specific case, since you have a value, which is a, a zero, then you don't need G zero. You could actually just run it with a neural network for that case. So that's a very good point because uh, when I looked at the other case with the, uh, with the equation I had for the, uh, if you now look at this one, here I have a specific value where I put G zero equal to 10. So that means that when X is zero, this term should not contribute. And then I should only have G zero. Now, if G zero is zero, then I don't need to bring it in. I would just run the calculation with X times that neural network. Did, did that help? Oh, so in this case, I just specialized to a function which depends only on X. If I have Y, then I have to bake that in as well. So if you have a two dimensional problem, you would have to think of how you could implement that boundary condition as well. And then you could typically have this multiplied with Y times one minus Y in addition. 
So the kind of uh, initial conditions you have and boundary conditions that dictates a little bit the way the factor you would have in front of the neural network. Because the neural network, in principle, the way it runs doesn't know anything about your conditions. However, this leads to a, a very interesting field. So if somebody is interested in that as possible topics for master thesis, this is something which is called discipline driven deep learning. So if you're doing physics, for instance, you have something which is called physics driven uh, deep learning, which means that you try to bake in the conditions or the, the information about the system. So like me doing quantum mechanics, I have to bring in the positions of the particles as an input. I often have uh, interactions which depend only on the relative distance. So I would feed that as a parameter into the neural network. So this will be more discipline driven deep learning. And that's a pretty hot field, a research field nowadays. And if you're diving into these topics, you are going to encounter topics like this discipline driven uh, deep learning methods. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a very important topic actually. Okay, so if we now go back to uh, uh, the code here, uh, in this specific code, so we are going to optimize with respect to the hidden uh, parameters and the output parameters. And remember now again that when we now deal, so this is a kind of repeat, which is also relevant for the second project. When you're dealing with a regression problem, you finding a function which represents your data, then typically the last output layer does not include a an activation function. So the output is what the last nodes spit out. And these are the ones which you use then to calculate your cost function. So, and in this case, typically what you end up with is to take the difference between the left-hand side, which is a derivative of your function, minus the right-hand side where you have a specific expression for it, if you have it. And then uh, down here, you will see implementations of it. You can actually try that with the network you're going to develop in project number two. Uh, these examples are made as simple as possible. So they contain just plain gradient descent where we run through all the points. And in this case, we are discretizing the integration points. So you can define as many points you want. And then you run through the network here. So in this case, there is a simple code which we actually discussed yesterday. So I'm not gonna repeat it, but it contains the basic functions. And we are calculating the derivatives uh, using Autograd. So we have the derivative with respect to X of the neural network. And then we also have a derivative of the trial wave function. And then we can calculate the right hand side of the ordinary differential equation in this specific case. And then we take the difference between the uh, derivative of, uh, of the trial function with respect to X minus the right hand side where we typically have an analytical answer for it, an analytical expression. And in this specific case, what we found uh, when we run it, I mean, we started with a pretty large error and with some thousand iterations, that means thousand forward and back propagation steps. We were then able to get a, uh, a final cost function, which is at the level of 6% here. And uh, you can see the plot between the uh, analytical result and the, the result calculated with the, with the hidden layer. Now with the, uh, with the neural network. Then you can add a given number of layers. And the reason why I'm bringing this up again is that this becomes relevant for your analysis in project number two, where you're going to play around with different types of uh, architectures. So you would typically start with one hidden layer and then you move to two hidden layer. And then if the result doesn't change much, you would typically say, okay, my network seems now to do, be doing what we expect it to do. Okay, I see that some of you, I mean, even if we love the sun, I see that some of you actually getting some sun right in your face. So let's just bring down this. <clears throat> Did that help? Good. It allowed me to make some noise as well. 
Okay. So the uh, uh, the uh, next calculation, which we, we, the next example here, is just one where we run with more hidden layers. And in that specific case, we actually run with two hidden layers. And I invite you to take a look at these codes. And in that specific case, we actually get a result which is worse than in the previous case. So that's a typical example of you playing around with different layers may not, if you have deeper and deeper networks, may not actually improve your results. So it could happen that you get the optimal result with just one hidden layer. But this is something you don't know a priori. Now, the next thing which we have here is an example uh, of uh, the uh, solution with uh, <coughs> both Autograd. Uh, so we've been using Autograd uh, consistently, but then we also compare it to the standard Euler scheme. So you can see if you scroll down, uh, the standard forward Euler, uh, now with uh, only few integration points, we're actually running between 10 and 100 integration points. But the scheme is the one which we discussed yesterday in the lecture. And in this specific case, we can compare then the standard Euler scheme with the, the neural network and the analytical results. And what you will find then is something like this. So in this specific case, for the equation, I've actually tuned a little bit better with more hidden nodes. I actually start with a pretty good initial cost and I have a final cost function, which is the difference between the right-hand side and the left-hand side, which is pretty small. And in this case, I actually am being a little bit mean to Euler's method because I have taken few points. So the calculations are run with the same types of inputs. So between 10 and 100 input variables, and if I have very few uh, integration points, then Euler's method normally has a pretty large error. And you can see that in the calculations here. So you can see that the, uh, the absolute, uh, the max absolute difference between uh, Euler method and the analytical one is actually pretty large. So this one can be made smaller and smaller. If I now tune the number of integration points, I can make them smaller and smaller, less, not larger and larger, yeah? and the analytical one. So in the neural network here, the calculation, if you look at the, at the code, you will see now if you go up here, I'm actually setting up, I have to, I should remember that one. So I have uh, 10 integration points. So if I use Euler's method with only 10 integration points, I'm not expected to get a perfect agreement. So this is actually, so I'm actually being, as I said, I'm not being kind to Euler's method. So by only 10 integration points, I mean, you, you have an error which goes like the step size to first order. So which means that you can have actually a pretty large error here. So if I were to decrease the step, the number of, uh, decrease the step size, increase the number of integration points, Euler's method would give a better result. But these are compared at the same level, yeah? Yes, okay. yes. So have you compared the, the distortions in the network from different points where you didn't agree? I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But that's a good question. So for those of you online, uh, this, because the, the uh, Euler's method is evaluated at specific integration points, whereas a neural network is actually valid for the whole range of points. So it could be interesting then to actually use these uh, neural networks to actually find the values at other points and compare that with the analytical result. So that's a good point. So the, uh, uh, if you're interested in this as explorations for project number three, uh, feel free to suggest that. So there, there's a lot of interesting numerical experiments which you can run with these kind of software. And many of you have been taking a course in parallel, which is called computational physics. And typically there, the last project is a project about implementing partial differential equations with finite difference schemes. And we've had many people who've tried to bring the two courses together. So you can actually reuse the information which you have from computational physics into this course here. And that would give you the possibility to write a project 
where you have where you make a comparison between many more methods and that's always useful and as i said differential equations do play an important role in uh, typically in thesis work and research in natural science but in many many other fields as well in finance and many other fields so in this case as i said i'm being a little bit unfair to euler's method and if i were to increase the number of integration points actually my neural network would also do better and but what you see here is that the uh, the final difference with the neural network is actually better so this is an example of where a neural network fares better than the standard euler method below you will find examples of solving partial differential equations where this is not the case where we actually need to improve on the architecture of the neural network uh, you will find uh, just to bring up here you can these are just a plot of the results so in here you will find the analytical results and the neural network and these are just plotted at the points which we have then you have a, a similar comparison between euler's method and in this case you see that Euler met, euler's method calculated only 10 points deviates uh, quite a lot from the analytical result and the one from the neural network but clearly if you were to run 100 points in this small domain between zero and one then euler's method would do much better however these methods have the drawback that you when you run them you cannot make your step size smaller and smaller or you cannot increase the number of integration points to as large a number as you want because at a certain point you're going to run into the problem of uh, loss of precision or loss of numerical precision and then your results can easily go totally wrong so with a kind of finite difference scheme one of the problems we face is that when calculating derivatives or integrating we may run into problems of loss of numerical precision in that sense the neural network is actually more flexible then there's another example and this brings us back to what we mentioned before about the boundary conditions there's a famous equation the Poisson equation so this is a classical case where you would actually solve the equations uh, using linear algebra by just inverting a matrix you can actually reframe this in standard finite difference theory uh, for solving differential equations as a linear algebra problem but here we have now uh, boundary conditions which we want to fulfill and in that case you can see now that an ansatz so here i don't have this g0 but now I'm just putting in this ansatz with x times one minus x, which now obeys my boundary conditions. And then I multiply it with a neural network. So in a certain sense, I'm informing the neural network that it has to obey some specific conditions. And again, uh, the code which you see here uh, is just an implementation. I mean, the neural network is agnostic in a way to what you're plugging in. So keep that in mind. So if you have written a general code for neural network, you could then just define a new cost function. And the cost function in this case is just the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of your differential equation. And then you square that. And then with automatic differentiation, which I tend to call painless dentistry almost, you actually have the possibility to write a very general code where you just take the calculate the gradient with automatic differentiation as it's shown in these codes here so where i then define uh, so what you see here is the basic neural network uh, and then i can define different number of hidden layers so you feel free to take a look at some of these examples in connection with project number two but then if you go down here when i'm solving the differential equation uh, just a little bit more down here you will find the right sign, right hand side of the differential equation and then i define the cost function which now has a trial function and then i define the trial function as x or one minus x multiplied with the parameters of the neural network and then i have a actually have an analytical solution i can compare it to and my cost function is now the difference between the right hand side and the derivative so you have the derivative here 
of my trial function. So you see now that the, it contains the G trial here. This is the function I estimate here. And with the automatic differentiation, it's very easy to write a general program without you having to code by hand the explicit expressions for the derivatives. And that's extremely useful. So it allows us to really, if we have a generally written code, it will allow you to actually reuse this one when you move into project number three, if you want to solve differential equations. And in this particular case, I actually compare the analytical solution with a neural network. And also in this case, it looks pretty good. As you can see from zero to one, I actually kept it a little bit high here. And you see also the, uh, the final cost function is roughly uh, three times 10 to the minus uh, three, which is actually a pretty good uh, cost function here. We start with a very large uh, cost, cost function and then the final cost function is actually within what I might call an acceptable result. And then you can compare this with a standard numerical scheme. We are not, I'm going to leave that to you for those of you who want to study these type of problems. Then in the examples here, you will find examples on solving the diffusion equation and also an example on how to solve the wave equation. And what you will see in this case is that the network is gonna be pretty slow. So it's gonna take time and the results are not so good. So which means that you need to improve upon the architecture if you want to solve more complex differential equations. But this is actually something, if you're interested in let's say weather forecasting, uh, people actually use machine learning to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. And uh, this is becoming a, a very useful tool, in particular if you have high dimensional differential equations. So I thought of spending some time on differential equations, because that's something which many of you may encounter. And I think this is also a fun application of different of the neural networks. So I'm going to uh, pause the recording here. And uh, we should take a small break. As I said before the break, we um, are now going to move into uh, another type of deep learning methods. And this uh, method of convolutional neural networks is actually based on the mathematical process of convolution. So I'm going to give you a quick reminder about convolution in the beginning here. And then today we are going to uh, basically to survey the basic structure of convolutional neural networks. And then next week, we are going to look more into the specific details on how we can set up a program for convolutional neural networks. So the idea today in this just one hour is to give you the kind of overarching view of a convolutional neural network and why we deal with convolutional neural networks. So it has a huge domain of applications, but perhaps the most important domain is on image recognition. So many of these kind of face recognition algorithms they often use some kind of convolutional neural network. And they're getting so refined now that uh, if you look at, I have a Chinese colleague and you can ask yourself whether you like this or not, but he's so happy because they have this face recognition uh, algorithms in China, which are so good that he doesn't need to bring his wallet with him. So when he goes to the subway station, his face gets recognized and he has paid the monthly fee and then the doors open. Uh, he has installed this at home. There's a face recognition camera which recognizes him and opens his home door. So he has no keys, no wallet, no nothing. But clearly, you can ask yourself whether it's very practical, it makes life easy, especially if you lose your wallet, which is very easy. Sometimes I can spend tens of minutes back home and just finding my wallet because I don't remember where I put it or some keys. But the, uh, there are many, many consequences. So one of the things, as we said in the beginning of the semester, uh, we are not going to touch upon many of the ethical aspects of the usage of machine learning algorithms. For us, this is a very powerful tool. Uh, if you're running experiments, you can often use a convolutional neural network to recognize specific patterns in a response from a detector, as an example. 
So at the facilities like CERN in Switzerland, which is uh, high energy physics, this is pretty common to use these kind of techniques in order to recognize the type of events you get from a detector. So these are extremely powerful techniques. Now, uh, before we move on, I just wanted to give you a quick motivation for why we dive into these topics. There's also, by the way, a list of uh, additional resources on differential equations, if this is something which is of interest. So just take a look at them. And like that Springer text by uh, Aslak Tveito and Ragnar Winter, which are two professors in mathematics here, that's a, that's a text which you can access for free if you log in to, if you are with a, with a university IP number. And this is actually a pretty good text on an introductory text on partial differential equations. But I just wanted to switch back to the whiteboard and uh, take a, a small look at an example, which is going to provide the motivation for why we would like to reduce the dimensionality of a given problem. So let's assume that we take an example here and suppose you have some sound files and you do record some uh, uh, sounds for a given number of time or a given number of seconds or minutes. And then you want to define whether this is a human or not a human. So this is a typical classification problem based on the sound which you have. And then you have a classification, true or false, whether it's a human or not, just to give you an example. So let's, uh, let's look at a typical case. So this would be a sound file. So you do some recording. And in this specific case, uh, we now, uh, since we've been preaching about neural networks, we got so fascinated that we want to apply neural networks to everything. So we want to do a neural network calculation. And in this uh, case, uh, you could now think of, uh, you have millions of sound samples. So as an example, you could have uh, 8,000 samples per second. Per second. So this is the kind of experiment which you're running. And uh, you do this for something like two minutes. So you have a sound recording and you could run it, run for let's say two minutes. This is just an example which I cooked up on the fly here. And now you want to classify whether this is a human which was speaking or not. So we want to deal with a classification. So it means that the uh, outputs, they have been labeled. Uh, so we have a trained data set, which is labeled with the inputs being labeled and the outputs being labeled. So a classification problem of the type true false. as a pretty simple binary case. Now, what we could do now is to, so we assume now that we have something like uh, X, the um, input is now uh, an input which now has roughly 10 to the sixth input variables. So this is just a plain assumption here. We run this for two minutes and we do something like 8,000 inputs per, per second. So this is our raw data file. Then we are planning to run now a, a neural network and we want to have three layers. So we do an NN with three layers. And in this case here, we are now going to have uh, 10 neurons in the first layer, 10 to the fourth neurons or nodes in layer one. So we just label this as an N1 here. And that means that the weight matrix, which we're dealing with for the first layer, we just put a subscript one here, uh, is now a matrix of dimensionality, something like 10 to the six times 10 to the four. So that means that we are going to have 10 to the 10th 
weights which we want to optimize. And then if we add the biases, so with biases, this is not a number which we need to add, but it's much smaller than 10 to the 10th. So since we have uh, 10 to the fourth neurons, so that means 10,000 nodes, then we have 10,000 biases, but clearly 10,000 is much, much smaller than 10 to the power of 10. So the number of parameters here, what we end up with is number of parameters, in this specific case, which is roughly 10 to the 10th plus 10 to the fourth, which is the number of biases, but we can uh, neglect the number of biases roughly. Then we take a layer two here, and in this specific case, we now define the number of nodes N2 in layer two to be equal to 10 to the power of three. That means that the weights which we have now, since we have 10,000 nodes which feed into the second layer, we get then a matrix of weights which is 10 to the power of four times 10 to the power of three. So we have an additional 10 to the seventh weights to determine. So that means that the weight matrix in this specific case is going to be a matrix which is of a dimensionality 10 to the fourth times 10 to the third. And in this specific case, we have now 10 to the seventh plus 10 to the power of three parameters, which roughly translates into 10 to the seventh parameters. So this is just a rough estimate which I'm making here. And then we have the third layer, which is now the output layer. So we say a layer three, which is the output layer. And that layer has only one node, right? Because we decided that we wanted to do a binary classification problem, which means then that it's either true or false. So there's only one output node. And that means that this one output node connects with the thousand nodes from the layer number two. And that gives us again then thousand points, no weights, which we have to uh, estimate. So in total then, if we do that, this is the output layer and we have only one node, only one node here. So that leads to 10 to the third parameters in the weight matrix. So if you add up everything here, so adding up Then we get something like 10 to the 10th plus 10 to the 4th plus 10 to the 7th plus 10 to the 3rd, which is the number of biases in the hidden layer, plus 10 to the 3, which is the number of parameters in the output layer, the weights, plus 1, which is the number of biases which we have in the output layer. But you see this is dominated by the first term here, 10 to the 10th. Now, what you see also here, when you look at this problem, now you see also clearly why the back propagation algorithm is better than a forward propagation algorithm for calculating the derivatives. Because you start with problems which are small sized and then you move backward in the network. So then the risk for accumulating a round of errors and then loss of numerical precision is less than if you start from the first point where you have 10 to the 10th parameters to determine. So one of the arguments for using the back propagation algorithm is exactly this. Now, when you look at this problem here, uh, 10 to the 10th parameters are trained. This is not something you want to do. And probably this sound file is a file which may contain a sparse amount of data, so there could be many zeros. So many results which are just not interesting. So what you would be tempted to do then is actually to reduce the dimensionality of that input variables 
So the uh, 10 to the seventh, in, 10 to the sixth input variables you have is something you could think of trying to scale down because some of them may not be relevant or they will just be zero. So you would like to propagate those variables which are non-zero. Now think of you setting up an image. So this is another example for why we would like to use something different than a standard neural network. So in a standard neural network here, we're just performing this matrix matrix and matrix vector multiplications, and we are keeping the full matrices. So in mathematics, these are called affine transformations. And here we end up with, a, if you think of a matrix matrix multiplication, if the matrix is a square matrix, and it has dimensionality n times n, then the number of floating point operation is n to the power of three. So n cubed. So if you have a matrix of dimensionality 10,000 times 10,000, and you perform a matrix matrix multiplication, the way you would do that in a standard neural network, then you end up with 10,000 to the power of three floating point operation for every iteration. So, and that's quite time consuming. And many of the elements of these matrices may actually be zero. So think of a house. If you've taken an image of a house and you want to recognize this as a house uh, via a learning algorithm, clearly the house has some windows, it has some corners, and it has paint or a color. And for those spots or those places in the house, where you don't have a window, where you don't have a door, where you have corners, it's basically information which is not very interesting to keep track of, right? So the uh, color of the house, you know, the house has that specific color, but you wouldn't trace all the pixels which just represent a part of the surface of basically no more information than it. It's a wall with a given color, right? So that means that we need to filter away some information. And that is what convolution is about. So convolution is actually you filtering away a specific type of information. So that means uh, that you have to find specific filters which keep track of the relevant information. So if you have a house, what you would keep then as information would be the corners. It would be the, where the roof begins and ends, uh, where the windows are and where the doors are. That would be the typical information which you would keep. And then if you need to classify that as a house, then you know exactly that this is the kind of information which is relevant. So many of these uh, uh, training sets and trainings on images, they have often been applied and specialized to specific types of images. So if you want to recognize specific animals, you would actually train a network with specific animals. So the network is specially designed to recognize some features. So this is again, what you might call discipline driven input to a network. But at the same time, you want to reduce these horrible dimensionalities. So if you have an image of 200 times 200 pixels, you have 40,000 pixels. And then if you have a million of these images, that tells you how big your design matrix is. So you would have a million times 40,000 as a dimensionality. And you don't want to fit that amount of weights. So this is a kind of overarching motivation for why we have to try to reduce the dimensionality. So read convolutional neural network as a deep learning method, which reduces the dimensionality of the problem. That's the way to read them. So what I wanted to give you now is just a very, very quick overview of some examples of convolution and what you may have seen in different scientific applications. So I'm just gonna take some 10, 15 minutes and go through examples. And then we are going of convolution. And then we are going to look at some of the basic structures of a convolutional neural network, which are the stages and what kind of parameters. And then next week, we are going to look more into the really gritty nitty details of a convolutional neural network. So I wanted more to use this lecture to give you the kind of overarching message of why we do this. So let's now bring back the, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks. I will stay with that one.
And I'm going to skip some of the intro material here, but there are also links to uh, these lecture notes in IN 5400, which is a course I highly recommend. There are some excellent slides from, I think it's Berkeley. Uh, I think it's either Berkeley or Harvard. I don't remember exactly. But the, as we mentioned now, uh, this problem with the affine transformations, which neural networks are represented by, where we deal with a dense matrix, this is something which is, uh, can quickly lead to uh, a, a training problem, which is basically not feasible to perform. Just stated like that. So CNNs have been widely used on images, as I said, sound files, medical images from CT scans and more. So it's a kind of standard method if you want to recognize, let's say, a tumor. So it's widely used in that in CT scans. So if some of you is doing a master degree, let's say in biomedical computing and imaging, uh, this will be a typical application of uh, the theory you're learning. Okay, so I just wanted to go down a little bit here and come back to uh, uh, the basic structures here. But I wanted to say something about the key idea. So uh, the mathematics of a CNN is in principle given by the mathematics of uh, convolution. And convolution is mathematically, if you look at a one dimensional example, is something which is now represented by some X of A, which you could think of your input. And this W here is something you could think of as a, it's normally called a weight function, or you could think of that as a filter. Suppose you're making a measurement, this X measures the position of a, of a car. Now, what you want is not the position of the car at all times, but perhaps at the final time. And what could happen is that the measurements you're making for all times, A, could be pretty noisy, except towards the end when you've got really some good data. And what you're doing now is actually you're filtering away the bad data with a weight function. So that's the essence of a, a convolutional process applied to, uh, uh, for instance, images or the data which we have. So you can think of this function W, which you see here, as a weight function or a filter. If you are familiar with the field of imaging, you may have heard of something like a Kalman filter. So if some of you have taken a course on imaging, this is a pretty common filter, which is used to filter away the noise in sound files, undesired noise. So in this case, you could just think of us making a measurement of a car and some of the measurements are pretty bad. And then we just want the measurement at the final time t here. And then we weight it with this function which filters out some of the data here. And mathematically, uh, you will see this integral often written in a compact form like this, with an x, a star times a w, and as a function of time. So have you seen, is everybody familiar with the, with the mathematics of convolution? Yeah, so you've, you've seen some of it. So not, not everybody may have taken a course on, on, the, on the kind of uh, the convolution. You can discretize this, and this is what we end up doing, because we are going to have, let's say, pixels. So that means we have a discrete set of data. And in that case, you would typically sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. And clearly, this is a sum which always has to be rectified a little bit, because we don't have an infinite amount of data, and we don't know how to represent infinity in a computer, right? So the uh, uh, discretized form is this one. I wanted to show you an example uh, on and this. The, there's a reason why I also bring up this example here. Uh, one of the reasons is that many of us, we tend to forget when we do polynomial multiplication that if we just write two functions like this, this function P and this function S and multiply them with each other. That's a very inefficient way of performing the multiplications. So when you took a course like, uh, for those of you who've gone at the University of Oslo, like IN 1900, 
you've probably been exposed to polynomial multiplication. And when you do two polynomials multiplied with each other, this is something which normally brings in many more floating point operations. And what you typically would do is to rewrite this polynomial multiplication in terms of a convolution process. So let me show you how you can do that. So this is more just to bring up a kind of basic feeling about what convolution means. So if you take these two polynomials and multiply them with each other, you should get a polynomial of degree five, right? I hope you don't get offended if I cook up these simple examples. And this means that there's gonna be a parameter delta zero, delta one, and so forth. And this is actually a polynomial. If you look at the evaluation here, if you evaluate these distinct terms by themselves, this is gonna save you a lot of floating point operations instead of just performing the multiplications of polynomial P of T and S of T. So the way you would do this now is to think a little bit, if you're doing this by paper and pencil, you would typically, uh, you will find out that this delta zero is alpha zero times beta zero. Delta one is a combination here. Actually, this should be beta zero, no, alpha zero and beta one, sorry, I didn't see that. You can, you can actually stare at your equations and everything looks nice. And then you realize that when you teach, you realize that there's a stupid error. This is just a copy and paste here. So this should be alpha zero times beta one. <clears throat> and then you would continue like this. And you see now that you have alpha i's from just, for just the values of zero, one, and two, and the beta ones, they are zero, except for zero, one, two, and three. You could rewrite this as a discrete convolution in the following way. <clears throat> So you could sum from i equals zero to infinity. This is actually not very efficient, what you're doing here. But this would be in principle, the way you could write this discrete operation <clears throat> in terms of a convolution. And in this case, you would simply write this as an alpha, a star, beta, and j here. Or you can write it as a double sum like this. So these are just two ways. And the drawback here, as you can see, is clearly that uh, the, uh, the drawback is that you're having a sums which run without any hindrance. So you, clearly this is something you can actually rewrite in a more compact way as a simple matrix vector multiplication. So if you look a little bit more carefully at this example here, what you would get then is that you can rewrite this in terms of a matrix which contains these param parameters alpha and you have a vector beta zero. Now, there's an important thing with the convolution, and that is that it's a commutative process. So I can actually take beta times alpha. And if I do that, I get a matrix which actually has a matrix vector multiplication, which actually has less floating point operations. So this is also very beneficial. So in this case now, instead of performing the sums, which go from principle minus infinity to plus infinity, I'm just performing a matrix vector multiplication. So what I'm doing here is just a very simple case of the process of convolution. So just one of the many, many examples which we can do. So when it comes to images, it means that we are going to filter away specific parts of the image so if you have a dense matrix, maybe we can reduce that matrix to just a three diagonal form. And when you have a three diagonal form and you multiply that with a vector, then you have much less floating point operations. So these are just some things to think of and, and why we would typically uh, introduce the convolution as a mathematical process here. Then, uh, the um, another kind of uh, uh, convolution which you may have encountered is the one of Fourier transforms. That's just another example. So typically, you could have a uh, function, and you know that uh, is everybody familiar with Fourier's theorem? So Fourier's theorem is a fantastic theorem. 
That means that if you have this type of oscillatory motion, you could actually uh, express this uh, variable xp or this function f of t in terms of a uh, series of sine and cosine functions. This is just black magic. It's, uh, when I saw it the first time, I was really, yeah, really impressed. And then you have the principle of superposition. You have uh, often something which is periodic. And here you can see a simple example code where I take a, a typical signal, which we could then represent by a, a Fourier series. So this is just a kind of a, a signal which goes from two down to zero, and then it is, you can see it's periodic, it just repeats itself here. So let me just shrink a little bit, shrink the, the damage size here, so you can see better. There we are. And typically, what you would do then is that the, uh, for this kind of sinusoidal example, you would then find uh, this function f, which is now going to represent this pulse here. This could be represented by a uh, series, where in principle the sum over these ends run from minus in, no, runs to infinity. So you have an infinite uh, set of cosine and sine functions. And you can calculate these coefficients f of n and g of n using the orthogonality of the sine and cosine functions. I'm not going to go through these details, but you can make a fit now on the, of this function in terms of the, so what you see here. So what, I, what I've done here is actually to use uh, 500 uh, sine and cosine functions. And I made a fit and you see the original signal, which is the blue thing here. And then you see the fit with a, a Fourier series. This is also an example of a convolution. So it can be represented mathematically by the process of convolution. So if you're familiar with Fourier series, this is another example. So in principle then, if you have now a two dimensional object, if we go back to uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, images which we are going to look at, uh, the typical way this is done and implemented in a, a convolutional neural network, and we are going to see examples of this specific process next week, is that you have a kind of convolution here where you have an input, and then you have a kernel which modulates uh, your input, and it may filter away some components. And you can actually, since it's uh, multiplicative, you can actually, associative, you can actually, uh, no, no, not as a commutative, sorry. You can actually rewrite this equation here, which is a discretized equation of an image, of a two-dimensional image, which depends on M and N. So this could represent the pixels. And you could then filter it away, filter away some of the properties by this specific function here, which normally is called a kernel. So these are the mathematical operations which we are going to look at. And the important thing for us when we look at the uh, convolutional neural network is actually we have to design this kernel or this filter function to specific applications and specific types of images. So it's not that you have one which fits one to rule all images. That tells you what kind of movies I tend to watch. But you would have to have uh, filters for different types of images. So let's go back a little bit now to, to the previous slides and look uh, a little bit on the architecture, which we are going to uh, discuss in more detail next week. So as I said, if we now look at the full image, what you end up with, with a neural network, and if you have an image of something like 200 uh, times 200 pixels, and then you have the color coding, so that means that you have a, the three color channels, which is a pretty standard way of representing an image. Then you see now that the, if you have an image of 200 times 200 times three, that would lead to something like 120,000 weights. And this is something which is pretty undesirable. And this is normally compressed. And the way you would do this now is to introduce a specific type of layers. So there is the input layer, which takes your image, 
So that is normally as it has always been. So we can't escape the input data. And then when you have the next thing is the convolutional layer. And that is uh, something which, where you would actually bake in the way you filter away some of the information, where you perform the convolution. So this is not exactly the same as a mathematical convolution, but uh, you can think of this as a filtering away of information which is irrelevant. And then uh, what you have done then is that you may have reduced the volume or the, the size of it to uh, uh, a specific uh, smaller dimensionality. And then what you have then is a real layer where you, actually people use often the rectified linear unit in order to produce a new output. So the, uh, in the convolutional layer, that is also where you would implement the back propagation. So you would not implement the back propagation in each layer. So the uh, typical like this uh, ReLU layer, the only parameter it has is actually the activation function. And then there is something which is normally called a pooling layer, which is a way to downsample the information even more. Uh, this connection between the different layers, they may not be fully connected. So if you think back of a neural network, one of the tricks which has been used there is to, for instance, only activate half of the neurons. So when you move the information forward to the next hidden layer, what you could do instead of using 100 neurons, you could use 50, and you could select these 50 randomly. And then they produce an output which links to the next layer. So that's one way of reducing the dimensionality of the problem. And here as well, what this pooling layer is actually doing it's doing a kind of downsampling of the dimensionality of the problem. So further downsampling. And then you would have something which is a fully connected layer where you could now perform, uh, so suppose this is your last layer. This is actually where you perform the score analysis. But there's nothing which hinders you to have this convolution stage. And then you downsize your information. And then the rest could just be hidden, normal, neural network layers. So a convolutional neural network is often a combination of different types of approximations. So you can have the convolution process, which squeezes down information. Then this fee produces some output, and that output can go into a normal neural network with a given number of hidden layers, because then you have reduced the dimensionality that the training is easy to perform. So you found the relevant features, and then you can progress with a standard neural network. Or you can have sets of these processes, convolution, the ReLU production of an output, and then this pooling layers, and on and on and on, till you have sampled down the dimensionality of the problem. So next week, we are going to look at some of these tricks. But what I wanted to end today is an example on how we can use Keras and for the convolutional neural networks, we are not going to write our own code. This is typically, that would typically be a semester project. If you were to write your own convolutional neural network, that would take much more time. And you writing a neural network gives you the basics. And a convolutional neural network, if you want to apply that in project number three, then the kind of advice which we normally give is that you could use either PyTorch or TensorFlow with Keras and then use a convolution neural network and compare that with other methods. Obviously, if you want to write your own convolution neural network or if you've done it already, you should feel free to use that. So, but what I wanted to show you now uh, is uh, the basic ideas and the way you would plug it in into a standard uh, Keras application. So, but just to quickly repeat, the, the architecture in its simplest case is a list of layers that transform the image volume into an output volume, which normally is much smaller. And there are a few distinct types of layers. There's a convolutional layer, there's a fully connected layer, there's this ReLU layer, which just produces an output. And then there is a pooling layer, which then is meant to downsize the uh, output further. And each layer can accept an input three-dimensional volume, 
and transform it and output to three dimensional volume through different through a differentiable function. And each layer may or may not have parameters. So like the convolutional layer and the fully connected layer have parameters, which we would determine with back propagation. So back propagation pops up everywhere again. But then we would have like the rail or the pooling layer, which don't have parameters. Or rather, you have fixed setups for these, because when you've chosen the rail activation function, you've actually made a choice in terms of a, a model architecture. And each layer may or may not have additional hyperparameters. And typically, this convolutional layer and the fully connected one can have the regularization parameter, but the rail layer does not have. So let's look at an example. This is what we went through before. And let's now look at a simple case. And we are going back to the uh, uh, MNIST data set. And what I've done here is simply to take the data set, which we discussed last week and the week before. We load the digits, num handwritten numbers between 0 and 9. And again, this is the downscaled set of images which has eight times eight pixels. And you see that the information is not uh, the best one. And when you do Keras now, and you want to use uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, what you need then to import uh, are the same things as we did when we looked at the standard neural network. We have to uh, define the input layers, whether this is a dense network, type of optimizers, regularizers, and then the type of output, which in this case is going to be a given category. We do the standard train test split as before. And then when we are setting up the convolutional neural network, you, and we are going to define many of these parameters in more detail next week. So uh, we would typically set up the convolutional layer with a given number of filters. Uh, we have something which is called padding, receptive field, which we also define in more detail next week we have an activation function which is the relo function and then we have the regularizers which we have to define and this is an l2 regularization term we have the pooling layer and i'm going to define in more detail what this stands for next week we uh, can flatten it this, this is a further uh, dimensionality reduction and then as you see here i can now decide that i want to have a regular neural network. I have a dense layer here. And then I just have the, my neurons are connected. I use an activation function as a relo. So it means that when I'm feeding in here, I have reduced the dimensionality of the problem considerably. And how you do that is something you have to play around with. And then at the end, I have my output layer. And since I have 10 numbers, I'm using the softmax function to classify the different numbers. And I have to define the regularization and the optimizers. So I, I stay with the L2 regularization. Uh, I need to define the number of epochs as before. Uh, the number of, uh, uh, these are the parameters, receptive field. I'm going to explain that in more detail next week. The number of connected neurons, so that's the standard neural network. The number of categories, which is 10, the number of learning rates, in my case, seven in a log space, and the same with the hyperparameter lambda. And then I'm simply running through my network. And if we just go on and look at the final visualization here, then we can get a feeling of the quality of the data. So let's just bring this up. And you can see this is a training accuracy. And I have a domain here for eight and lambda where I get a perfect training accuracy. So this is actually better than the uh, implementation which I showed you yesterday for a standard deep neural network. And if I then look at the test, which is the interesting quantity, if you look at the test accuracy, I'm actually getting a test accuracy of 98%, which is at the level of uh, humans for this data set. So they actually have uh, let uh, many, many humans look at this data set and see how they classify the numbers. And humans typically classify this number correctly at the level of 98%. So my convolutional neural network here does the same as a human, which I would say is pretty good.
So next week, we are going to look at the details of a convolutional neural network. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have time to write our own code. So I hope you can forgive me for that. Uh, but we can use this, and you see with Keras, which is an uh, interface to TensorFlow, it's easy to set up the structure of a network. And that is something which also functions as a kind of overarching guidance when you are writing your own code. And this is very relevant for project number two. So this is going to end the lecture today. And I have to thank you guys for being so patient again and uh, have a great weekend enjoy day and please feel free if you have questions to ask questions yes have a good weekend thank you, thank you. so for those of you online i'm going to stop the recording and best wishes for the weekend to you as well <laughs>